on this week's exciting episode of the Perry Pod. There's trouble right here in Logan City. That starts with a capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for Perry. It's season one, episode four of Perry Mason, The Case of the Drowning Duck. episode of the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy. My purpose here is pretty simple, to provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. The goal is to do a pod for every episode of the television series and, if time permits, to cover some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each week, I'll give a refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare it with the show. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia, as well as tackle the episode's main theme. Finally, we'll feature a Perry proverb, and this week we'll introduce a post-case water cooler, where just like Della, Paul, and Perry, we can further rehash the case. But first, to the law library! <laughs> Each week in the Law Library, we'll review previous cases and fill in some details we might have missed. There's the little case of the series Automobiles, something we highlighted in episode one but have since skipped on. While Perry has continued to rock the 1957 Ford Skyliner with the retractable roof that he drove in the first episode, his clients and detectives have been driving their very own automobiles. For instance, in episode three, Sybil Granger was driving a Plymouth and Paul Drake's men were behind the wheel of a 1957 Lincoln Premier. That's a pretty nice ride for a plain-clothes detective. Next, there's the case of money. Early in the last episode, George Lutz, the miserly murder victim, mentions that he hates that his daughter spent $1.34 a pound for steak. In 2017 cash, that works out to $11.86. That's still pretty high. Mr. Lutz might have a point. Incidentally, it's super fun to find an inflation calculator and plug in the money details you hear in these episodes to see how much they would be in present day cash. Now to this week's case. <laughs> The Case of the Drowning Duck first aired on October 12th, 1957. We begin in sun and sand-soaked Logan City, a burg where every citizen is required by law to carry a handkerchief so as to wipe off the buckets of sweat occasioned by the city's heat. We first meet a mysterious man we find out is Donald Briggs. He greets a mysterious woman we come to find out is Lois Reed. Welcome back to Logan City, Mrs. Reed. I'm Donald Briggs. Briggs has been investigating the lineage of college student Marvin Adams for the father of Marv's fiance. Mr. Briggs quickly proves himself to be a heel and a blackmailer who is using Lois Reed as pressure to get certain people in town to pay up. All right, Mrs. Adams. You have a son. He's a chemical engineering student at the State University. He's engaged to Helen Waters, the daughter of one of this town's leading citizens. Enough? Everyone's quite aware of those facts. But everyone's not so aware of the facts concerning the boy's father. I know most of them. What I don't know, I intend to learn from Lois Reed. $5,000 worth within 48 hours. You contemptible blackmailer. Mr. Waters, Helen's father, has hired Briggs, but now that Briggs knows about Marv's past, that Marv's father was Ben Devereaux, who was tried, convicted, and executed for the murder of his business partner, David Latwell, right here in Logan City, he's using that information to bilk the cash out of anyone and everyone he can find. After Briggs churns the screws on Mr. Waters himself, his own employer, Waters wisely churns to Perry. Any special reason? Marv is a perfect gentleman. Strangely enough, he didn't seem to know much about his father. Said he died when he was quite young. Well, it worried me, and I wanted to know more. So I hired this fellow Briggs. And Briggs discovered the boy's father was Ben Devereaux. 
The man who was executed for murder. That's right. Mason investigates enough to know that the trial that convicted Devereaux Marv's father was a travesty of justice. We don't have any desire to have you come into our community and start retrying our cases. The man's dead. What's to be gained by bringing it up again? Something with which we're both familiar? Justice? As Perry further acquaints himself with the citizens of Logan City, he sees Marv performing a magic trick that renders a farm duck unable to swim, thus giving the episode its title. Is it your thinking that all ducks can swim? Yeah! Oh, then you do not believe there's such a thing as a duck that can drown? No! Oh, then let's watch carefully. This magic water I have here makes fish walk and pigs fly. It also can make a duck drown. How could you make the duck sink like that? Oh, it's a chemical mixture I made up at school. It takes all the oil out of the duck's feathers. Oh, I get it. The chemical that caused the duck to temporarily drown is used to kill Briggs, and Marv looks to be the best suspect. In the town's eyes, like father, like son. It may have been a terrible miscarriage of justice, Marv, and if it was... And if it was, what do you intend to do about it? Bring my father back to life. Only Helen stands with Marv as the Logan City Judiciary tries to slow Perry's courtroom pyrotechnics with heat that is itself the equivalent of fire. Not regarding any conjectural tendencies of sadism on the part of the defendant, that would still call for a conclusion from the witness. Just one moment. I realize this court, as well as this trial, is not up to the dimensions the defense counsel usually specializes in. But since he has taken the case, he will allow the bench to make the necessary decisions. You really did yourself up fine, counsel. Don't let this country court fool you, Dillon. Judge Meehan knows his law, but as prosecutor Cortland. We don't get up ahead of steam from somewhere, we're going to get beaten. Along the way, Marv's mother dies, Perry uncovers the mysterious woman at the center of Ben Devereaux's trial, Lois Reed, and realizes that the person who murdered David Latwell also murdered Donald Briggs. Briggs approached Martha Norris for reasons of blackmail, and Martha Norris killed him as well. She had no right to him. She had no right to any of them. David's better off dead. Look what he would have had. Just look. Marv finds it hard to let go of the past or present, but having Helen by his side to lock lips will certainly help. While the episode and the novel it's based on share basic similarities, a murder detective, Marv Adams, and the same guilty party, Gardner presents us with a much more complex case. Three noteworthy features of the novel. Number one, we get a great opening page that reveals a key characteristic of Perry Mason. Quote, once when Della Street, Perry Mason's private secretary, had asked him what was the most valuable attribute a lawyer could have, Mason had answered, that peculiar something which makes people want to confide in you. End quote. Jim Davidson, author of the Perry Mason book, stresses that it is this quality, the ability to allow others to confide in him, that Raymond Burr captured in the character of Perry Mason that previous actors who had tried to occupy the role had not. While those particular actors stressed Mason's strength, Burr captured Mason's willingness to listen to others. Very interesting. It's not something that overtly comes up in the case of the Drowning Duck, the TV episode, but it's certainly there in the way Burr portrays Mason's character. Number two, Gardner's case is super complicated, way more complicated than the television show. The character, who is the equivalent of Lois Reed in the novel, she doesn't even show up because she's dead, suspected of suicide long before the novel's action begins. Marv's mom, similarly dead too. In fact, Marv Adams never even gets put on trial. That privilege gets handed to the father of Marv's fiance, who is named Weatherspoon in the novel. He gets charged with the murder of a house guest who dies in the same manner as the novel's seedy blackmailing detective. That's right, within the confines of the novel, there's two murders to adjudicate as well as the death that ended with Marv's dad getting executed. Most ironically, Mason's final explanation indicates that the second murder, or death, wasn't a murder at all. It was a suicide meant to frame another innocent party. For obvious reasons, television writer Al Ward ditched all that, brought 
brought Lois Reed back to life, gave Marv the added pathos of seeing his mom die, and feeling the town's rejection by being the one who was put on trial just like his father. Number three, something Ward did not do, which Gardner did, is make the titular drowning duck a key part of the story. While the show doesn't completely erase the duck's importance, Gardner actually puts the drowning duck at the scene of the crime and then has Mason pull a fast one with the duck's identification and location. In fact, reading Mason questioning and calling into question someone's ability to identify a particular duck is high comedy. Alas, TV was in a place for such extended chuckles. Whew. Anybody down for some trivia? In our trivia section each week, I'll give you three takeaways. A Paul, a Della, and a Perry. Paul is a subject worth investigating more. Della is something about a particular character in the story. And Perry is something we learn about our main character, our intrepid hero. Our Paul this week concerns the means by which young Adams gets the duck to drown. The show gives us Adams pouring a solution on the duck and it promptly sinking. In the novel, Adams adds the mixture to the water and then the duck struggles to swim. Do a little investigating on the origins of detergent. That's right detergent introduced to the U.S. market just before Gardner wrote his original novel, which is described in the novel as a substance that removed the natural antipathy between oil and water. In the novel, the science behind the duck's drowning gets a full explanation. Do a little digging yourself if you're interested. Ardella this week concerns Judge Meehem, portrayed by the robe as chewing Nolan Leary. He appeared once more in the Perry Mason show as another judge named Judge Gray in the case of the Golden Oranges in 1963. Worthy of note, Leary was born in Rock Island, Illinois, one of the Quad Cities, in 1889. I love his line to the prosecutor. Objection sustained. But Judge! Harry, when a man's right, he's right. And our Perry this week concerns Perry's ability to solve two crimes for the price of one. That is, by finding the murderer of David Latwell, he is also able to find the murderer of Donald Briggs. Perry will do this, according to the Perry Mason TV series wiki site, 17 more times over the course of the series. So this is something that the writers will return to. Now it's time for our big theme, revenge. The motive for Marv's dad, Ben Devereaux, killing his partner, David Latwell, is pretty non-existent. It's a wonder why that doesn't come up more often in the original trial. The real motivation for the crime was revenge. Wife Martha Norris was getting even with her husband for dishing her for the younger preacher's daughter. Marv, on the other hand, is suspected for killing Briggs out of revenge as well because Briggs knows the truth about his father. And even after he's cleared, he's presented with the temptation to get revenge and harbor ill feelings against the citizens of Logan City for what they did to his father, his mother, and himself. But Perry's response leads us to this week's Perry proverb. <laughs> The case is over. Marv has just been reunited with his fiancée, Helen. And after voicing his anger with the town, Marv gets some sage advice from Perry. Now listen to me, Marv. Eighteen years ago, a mistake was made. A horrible mistake. But you won't undo the wrong if you let it color the rest of your life. I only saw the whole town turn against me overnight. Did you, Marv? Helen's part of the town. Mason never articulates this specifically in the show, but one of the reasons he's so committed to the idea of finding the murderer and not just getting his client off for the murder is that he knows the closure that comes from finding the real killer can give his client freedom moving forward. He encourages Marv to accept this chance to embrace Helen's love for him, that love is stronger than hate. Revenge only leads to violence. Love leads to reconciliation. Della has some further advice. Well, don't just stand there. Do something. 
And now for a new finale to the podcast. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. If the Perry proverb is something equivalent to Perry's revealing of the murderer, a final conviction, or a ruling from the bench, then this new section will be the post-confession water cooler, where we see the gang kicking it and getting things clear. This week, it's just a chance for me to ask for feedback. Was there something about this week's pod that struck you? Something you'd like to comment on? Something that you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website, which can be found at theperrypod.libsyn.com, or you can email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show's notes. Next week, we learn how to get our sulk on with Francis Chalane in the case of the sulky girl. Until then, I'm Jonathan Searcy saying keep on walking that Fifth Avenue beat.